Thank you very much, Kristen. And I'd like to thank uh, Hugh Lean and all the team in Singapore. I think it's been uh, a really a real pleasure for me uh, to be here today. So we'll uh, talk about airway pressure release ventilation or APRV. And first of all, I would like just to show you a definition, which was an initial definition of APRV, which was done in 1987. You can see, first of all, that it's been defined as a continuous positive pressure, uh, so a CPAP, with a time cycled brief release at lower pressure. And that basically will allow also some spontaneous breaths throughout the respiratory cycle. Now, you can see that is not a very specific uh, definition. And this, I think, has generated a little bit of confusion um, since uh, the beginning. And essentially, the questions that lots of people ask all the time is, how is APRV different from a standard ventilation? And how is APRV different from inverse ratio ventilation? And um, why don't we set tidal volume or why there is no peak? I'll show you later on. And why is APRV personalized? And we'll talk later on, more importantly, how to personalize APRV to the lung compliance of the patient. And finally, why is it adaptive? So in other words, the settings will change with the either deterioration of the lung or hopefully with the improvement of the lung compliance. So just to give you an idea is that you can see on the left hand side there are some there are some see where I can get some spotlights there you go so you can see that there are some um, waves uh, pressure waves uh, at the top and at the bottom there and you can see that essentially your, um, um, the inspiratory time there is quite fixed and, sorry, just uh, for some reason I cannot uh, move my slides. Um, let's see. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you can see that there is a short inspiratory time and a fixed expiratory time. So that is more like uh, BiPAP than APRV. Whereas now we can do a personalized expiratory time and we can see later on how we can adjust the, the TLO to essentially adapt the lung mechanics. So the only one that we would recognize as APRV today is the one at the bottom, D, uh, which includes a P-low of zero and a T-low that is adjusted, but more about this in a second. So what we can say is that APRV is a form of CPAP that can be used either as a spontaneous breathing mode or it can also be used as a controlled, non-spontaneous breathing mode. So this is another source of confusion, and I'd like to reassure you that you can use them in both situations. It can also be used in any degree of lung injury, so uh, either in the milder forms, mild to moderate, or the more severe. And it can be used also as a primary mode of ventilation, so when you start FPRV from the beginning, or can be used as a rescue mode of ventilation. So when patients have been tried on a different modality of ventilation and they've failed, and so we come to APRV later on. So we can say that uh, APRV, or we use it here T-CAV, I'll show you what it means in a second, has got two phases and four parameters. So in a way, it's a quite easy um, mode of ventilation, and I'll show you how to set it properly in a second. So first of all, this is a pressure wave, waveform, and a time. So these are the two first two components that we need to adapt, pressure and time. And within the pressure, there is a pressure high, which is the inspiratory pressure, and the pressure low, which is the expiratory pressure. And similarly, we've got a time that is time low, so the time that is spent at low pressure, and the time high, which is the time spent at high pressure. And with that, we've got two phases. Now, if we take the time high and the pressure high, that will constitute the CPAP phase of APRV. 
whereas the time and the pressure, a, t, a, a low pressure and low time, is the release phase. So now we've got four parameters in two phases. And this is what it looks like on the ventilator. You can see at the top, you see the pressure waveform, the pressure time waveform, uh, in the middle, the flow waveform. And you can see that it looks quite different from the normal uh, or standard ventilation. And we'll uh, learn a little bit more in a second. And essentially on the ventilator, now you can recognize the P high, in this case, the centimeters of water, which is the inspiratory pressure or the CPAP pressure. You can see that the time that the patient will spend on P high is the inspiratory time, which in uh, APOV nomenclature is called T high. And the T low is the time spent at expiration. And you will see later on that the P low or the expiratory pressure is always set at zero centimeters of water. Now, don't be scared because the patient will not be at zero PEEP, and I'll show you later on why that not, is not the case. And uh, the slope, uh, we always use zero as a slope, so we will not talk about this anymore. So now you can see, first of all, that when I try to draw a PRV, uh, you can see that you've got a possibility of a controlled breathing, you can see that in, 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 in white, but also the patient during T high um, can breathe at spontaneous breathing essentially as if this patient was on CPAP. So it's not different. And in this case, there is no problem with synchronization because the patient is on a completely spontaneous mode at CPAP. So I think before starting APRV, I think I would uh, encourage you all to just assess hemodynamics, just make sure that intravascular status and the preload dependency is satisfied. And hopefully, if you can, just have a look with an echocardiogram with right heart function. So how do we set APRV? Um, so first of all, we look at the time. So the time that is spent at high pressure, so the T high. Now, normally in adults will vary between four and six seconds. And now we can go uh, more sort of uh, towards the four seconds um, if we think about rescue ventilation or there is a high PACO2 to start with because obviously we want a, a higher number of releases per minute to improve carbon dioxide removal at the beginning. And obviously, if there is no spontaneous breathing, then we might start with a shorter. And obviously longer if there is spontaneous breathing, if the CO2 is normal, and or if the patient is already in the weaning phase. Now, when we use APRV as a rescue mode, so patients perhaps they are failing other modes of ventilation, they are hypercapnic, then we might want to start with a shorter T high, two to three seconds to start with. And sometimes the best idea is to match the respiratory rate on APRV to that one that was pre-switch. So you can calculate it that way. You can see 60, which is in seconds, divided by the original respiratory rate. That will give you that uh, the duration of the respiratory cycle. And then we'll see later on how to set the T low. And from the total T cycle, you take away the T low, and therefore you have the setting of your T high. And obviously, once the patient is stabilized, we go back to the original setting. We'll try to stretch the T high as much as possible. Um, so this is why we want to stretch the T high, and this is why APRV is so effective. You can see this is a pressure waveform of a APRV, and that is the pressure waveform of, let's say, volume control ventilation. Now, you can see that volume control ventilation will have a T high of about one second, more or less, whereas the APRV normally is around five seconds. Now, you can see in these lungs in the middle and some of the alveoli, uh, what happens and what is the difference between having one second and five seconds. Just have a look. This is one second, the lungs. 
at least it's five seconds to the lungs. You can see that five seconds will give much more time to the lungs and avoids, stabilizes the lung, avoiding inflation and deflation of the alveoli that causes lung injury. Also, you can see that one, the, if you see the inspiratory time is very short, at the beginning, you can see on the left hand side, there's a very little time for the airway, um, for the airway pressure to stabilize the alveoli. It will be mainly localized into the conducting airway. So actually what we do is, is mobilizing airways rather than recruiting alveoli. Whereas when we give more time, apologies, you can see that now we've got time for recruitment of the alveoli and stabilization, particularly when the lung has got different time constants and therefore is quite you know, homogeneous. Now this is one patient at day zero and this is after two days of APOB and you can see that the time of recruitment has helped uh, this patient in terms of gas exchange and lung compliance. Now this is a different patient but using electrical impedance tomography and you can see that at the top, um, so this is the ventilation uh, in blue and you can see uh, the ventral at the top and the dorsal at the bottom, right and left on either end. And you can see that the bottom of the lung, the dorsal areas, are not very well ventilated. Even after the recruitment maneuvers, they are not very well ventilated. But as we start a POV, you can see after 20 minutes, 45 and 90 minutes, you can see the lung aeration and ventilation has improved quite dramatically. Now, in terms of PLO, that's easy. It is easy because it's always zero centimeters of water. And we can see later on how setting at zero does not result in the recruitment, provided the TLO is set correctly. Now, some people are scared about having TLO, PLO of zero, and they try to give few centimeters of water of PLO I would discourage you from using that because usually the carbon dioxide might increase and there might be some impaired secretion clearance because the differential between P high and P low of zero is what determines a very high expiratory flow, which in turn can mobilize secretions and keep the small airways open. Now, I would like to pay important attention here because this is the most important element of APRV, which is the TLO. Now, you can see there that to set the TLO, um, you look at the airway pressure at the top, but what is important is the flow uh, time curve. And you can see that the uh, the, after the peak expiratory flow, the, there is a passive exhalation, and so the expiratory flow will have a slope that if we left it uh, going to zero, will lead to full expiration. And in that case, the uh, end expiratory pressure will be similar to the P-low, which will be zero. But we won't do that because we'll stop the expiration at a certain point, and I'll show you how to set it in a second. And this will guarantee that the uh, alveolar pressure will always be greater than the set peak. So this is just an example of drawn. You can see the pressure during the APRV at the top, and you can see the flow. Now, what we can see that if we leave uh, the flow go down to zero, then of course there is complete expiration. In that case, the peep of the lung will be equal to zero, but we will not do that. Now, if we um, set the T low to be a little bit shorter, then you can see here that the, the P low is too long and might lead to alveolar instability. Now, our perfect optimal one is essentially the T low that will ensure that the inflation happens when the, the, the flow is 75% of the peak expiratory flow. Now, I will explain this a little bit better with a little video. You can see here, this is a PRB. We freeze the screen 
and we'll go back and we measure the peak expiratory flow. Now, for sake of convenience, we'll say that is minus 100. And it will just want to make sure that the flow at the time when reinflation occurs is essentially uh, 75 percent of that so 75 you can see that ratio now you can also see when i do an expiratory hold that maintaining the telo 75 will achieve a certain peak in this particular case 16.5 centimeters of water so the lung will not see the telo of zero but we'll see a certain amount of peak depending on the p-high. So now if we go to the next slide, we can see what it looks like in practice. And now it should be a little bit more familiar to you what the um, P, the pressure and the flow curve happens. So in this particular case, the TLO is 0.58. So it's a lung. You can see that's the slope of the expiratory flow. You can see that that is uh, the PEF or PEF, is the peak expiratory flow, and EEF stands for the end expiratory flow. So we want the two ratios to be 75%. Okay. And in that case, that's why we call it time controlled adaptive ventilation, because by modifying the T low, we adapt. The, the ventilation to the particular compliance of the patient. So, for example, this is, there are three lungs uh, with different severity of lung disease, from mild on your left to moderate in the middle to severe at the end. You can see that the lung volume is smaller, so therefore the compliance will be lower. And you can see as the compliance is lower, the T low will be shorter. And so this is quite important because you can see that if that is the peak expiratory flow on the uh, y-axis and the time is on the right, as the patient gets, or it, when the, at the beginning when the patient is in worse compliance, you can see the slope will be quite acute and the time will be shorter. So let's say 0.3 to achieve the same 75%. But the patient gets better and the compliance improves, then the angle becomes flatter. And in that case, maybe you can see that the expiratory time now is 0.5 of a second, but still it'll be 75% of the peak expiratory flow. So that's quite important. We adapt with the lung, but the rule is always the same. And you can see that in a graphical form, how as the compliance changes, your um, slope changes and the T low changes. So this is also how important it is. You can see on the left hand side, we've got a pressure high of 32 centimeters of water and a T low of 0.5 of a second. Now, if we do an end expiratory hold, then the pressure there or the P will be about 20, 20 centimeters of water. Now, if we change the T low and that is not appropriate, so let's say we just want to increase the T low and it will be less than 75%, you can see that the pressure there is 18. So it starts to drop again because the lung has been given more time to exhale. And so therefore the lung volume is reduced and the pressure is reduced. Now, if this is inappropriately long, the TLO, that can lead to derecruitment and can lead to airway and uh, alveolar instability. So this is to show the concept of alveolar instability. So now you can see, sorry, you can see this is on the left hand side is pressure control ventilation, a different level of PEEP. Now what you can see in yellow are the alveoli, the alveolar size. So you can see a PEEP 5 during inspiration, some few alveoli, they get bigger, some others stay small. So you can see the lung is quite heterogeneous. And a PEEP on expiration, then you've got collapse of some of the airways. You can increase the PEEP 
And what you can see, the, the heterogeneity is maintained and at end of expiration, you've got de-recruitment, unless you get to very high peak, which is a peak of 24. But you can see on your right hand side that you can achieve the same thing with APRV and much lower pressures just by adapting the TLO at 75%. So you can see at 75% you've got uh, a lung homogeneity. If you let the lung collapse with a longer TLO, then uh, the lung becomes unstable. So you can see the difference between inspiration and expiration. So this is a concept of a lung which is injured and then it gets inflated. And the only thing that inflates is one portion of the lung, the more depend non-dependent region. You can see the alveoli are absolutely unstable. They inflate and deflate very rapidly on expiration. The problem is you can see that CT scan that the lung is completely inhomogeneous in RDS. You've got some areas they remain collapsed and other they're open. And this leads to an important concept. So you can see the lung, which is healthy at the top. You can imagine this alveoli being all the same size and shape. When we ventilate this patient, we get an inflation that is stable and homogeneous in size and shape. But the one at the bottom is the lung injured, the lung with the RDS. You can see it's completely um, heterogeneous. And when the lung is inflated, it will inflate in a heterogeneous way. So when we give a pressure, let's say, of 30 centimeters of water that we think is absolutely within uh, um, protective parameters. However, because of the heterogeneity, that 30 centimeters of water will be multiplied and that will become very injurious at pressures about 60 to 120 centimeters of water and that is why it's so important having a long um, t inspiratory time during APOV because that can achieve a much better homogeneity of the lung and therefore reduce the local pressure uh, and so this is the same concept I explained earlier on. So these are alveoli, you can see in pressure control of five for peep, and you can see injured lung is very unstable. It collapses, uh, a higher peep, it still collapses, whereas at um, APOV you can see, first of all, there are more alveoli and they are much more stable. They're very tight to each other. Now, you can do all that with ventilation and uh, with APRV adjusting the, P, the T low, or you can let uh, the Draeger ventilator do it for you, and there will be a presentation later on. But essentially, you can choose the auto release setting, and that will ventilator will adapt to the lung mechanics and will change the T low that represents the 75% of the experience time. Now this is one concept that I think is very 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 important. So when we use a protective lung ventilation using uh, let's say pressure control or volume control, in normal situation the compliance follows the lung volume. So in other words if the lung volume is high, let's say healthy patient, the compliance will be high. And if the, uh, if the lung volume is down in a diseased patient, then the compliance will go down. But now, when we give a fixed tidal volume, let's say six mils per kilo of a 70, 70 kilogram patient, so the, the tidal volume is fixed at 420 milliliters, then it might be too small if the lung is normal, and it will be too high if the lung is severely inflated or is, is severely affected with a, lo with a low lung compliance. Whereas in APRV, the tidal volume will change. It will be low when the lung volume is low and it will be improving and increasing as the lung improves. In other words, this will maintain the ratio between tidal volume 
an FRC, which is called strain, and therefore will limit the injurious effects of high tidal volumes for a very small lung. So this is quite important. Now, um, this is just a summary, and I've taken from APRV Network. Uh, you can subscribe, it's for free, it's a great resource. And basically, the PHI, this is the initial settings uh, for primary mode of ventilation. So if you come from a pressure control, uh, you can use peak pressures. If you, um, so you can set the P high is equal to the peak pressure in, in pressure control. Or if you come from a volume control, you can set the P high equal to your plateau pressure. Your P low is always zero. We have seen about that. And the T high, you can, you can match the respiratory rate pre-switch, okay, as we have described before. And the T low, you can start with generally 0.4 to 0.5 and then check on the ventilator to make sure that the end expiratory flow divided by the peak expiratory flow rate is 75%. Okay, and you can adjust it to make sure that that is the case because that is the most important thing in a PRV. Now, in terms of the, P, uh, the, the rescue mode of ventilation, you can see that obviously the P high will depend on whether the RDS is mild, moderate, or severe. And clearly, the, the, the higher the severity, the higher will be the P high. But you can see, you can start at those levels and then adjust until the FiO2 is gone less than 60% with a PO2 greater than 95. The P low is always zero, and the T high, as we've said, um, you can start, uh, those are the ranges you can see, and then you can adjust uh, and try to increase it by 0.2 to two seconds at a time once the PCO2 is stable or at target. And those are the T low. These are just starting points, but the important thing is once you've started for few breaths, then adjust it to get the 75% that we talked about. So a few, last few minutes, some clinical data, you can see that low tidal volume ventilation can be injurious, APRV can improve lung homogeneity. These are ex vivo lung perfusion, uh, which basically says that APRV improves PF ratio, improves uh, up to two hours and four hours, improves the compliance, and decrease the weight gain. So essentially, these lungs are less sedimentous and less injurious. There has been one randomized controlled trial looking at uh, APRV versus lung protective ventilation. And essentially what they found was a reduction in, in uh, so an improvement in ventilation three days and reduction in mortality. So this is just to show that APRV, which is in orange, decreases over time the plateau pressure, the compliance has improved over time at uh, the bottom. The mean airway pressure is, a little, is higher than, than the low tidal volume and the FiO2 has improved quite dramatically very quickly. And you can see that the time to, uh, from beginning to uh, being able to breathe without assistance is certainly reduced um, in APRV versus the low tidal volume ventilation. This is just more data, but essentially I want to show you that it's safe. The percentage of pneumothoraces from day one to day 28, it was 4% in APRV and 10% in the low tidal volume ventilation. So if done uh, carefully and with experience, then you will see that APRV is a safe mode of ventilation. This is a systematic review, which basically shows that APRV 
um, will increase ventilation free days by about six days and decrease the ICU length of stay by about 3.9 days. Now, this is particularly important in COVID. You can see that in COVID, this is a Lancet paper that shows that over time, patients with COVID will have a change in their uh, lung mechanics and lung radiology. So they go from early um, lung radiology that shows unilateral or multifocal involvement with some ground glass. So uh, at the beginning, um, quite um, little lung involvement. So APIV in this case can be used at very low pressures just to maintain uh, alveolar stability and prevent deterioration. But as time goes on, there is more consolidation, there is more edema. And in that case, APRV can be used, as we described, um, just to maintain, uh, to improve recruitment and avoid further deterioration. And over time, unfortunately, if the lung deteriorates, then consolidation becomes more fixed. So we need to avoid that um, and prevent that latter phase that then leads to lung fibrosis. And this is the concept uh, that we've described as uh, phenotypes with low oxygenation, but either More compliance, the phenotype age, you can see the CT scans at 3D at the left hand side. But essentially, we can use LPRV in both cases, but essentially the pressures and the times will have to modify, be modified in relationship to that different compliance. So this is quite important. Now, in the last two slides, I'm just going to say about the weaning which essentially is, as weaning, we are going to progressively reduce the P high and increase the T high. So essentially what we are doing, we are moving from APRV to essentially CPAP ventilation. And so uh, we progress it very slowly until essentially the patient spends most of the time at a T high and P high, essentially spends time at CPAP. And this is a, just an idea uh, that we stretch the time and we drop the pressure. We continue to do so until the patient is on CPAP alone. And then the patient can breathe spontaneously and be extubated directly on CPAP, does not need to have additional pressure support. So this is just the same concept that we can try a long stretch to see whether the patient can take over the work of breathing and we can assess comfort. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And Christian, over to you. Thank you, Luigi, very much for this great presentation on APRV. Um, I think we've learned a lot from really the basics as in how to how to set what is the whole philo philosophy behind APRV maximizing lung recruitment to um, different strategies for different patients and then finally also how to wean patients with APRV. I think this is um, this is already a great overview.